Lovely. Well, I think it's about another minute or so we'll be going by. I'm going to kick off and share an introduction and obviously hopefully more people can join in as I talk your way through what's on store today. So welcome everyone. This is our second instalment, the second webinar in our three part series, which has been designed especially just for the education sector to really support everyone here today and your uh, wider network with income generation and community engagement through your facilities lettings and really how do you maximise the opportunity that's sitting at your doorstep. So as I said, I'm absolutely delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. So I'm Beth and I'm from Oates Consultancy. And I'm absolutely delighted to say that we've been working in partnership with our friends, Lifestyle Fitness and Not Sport. So last week, uh, Oaks, we actually kicked off the series. So we shared our insight across a webinar about um, how to maximise your lettings management scheme, uh, the process to think about um, and working with or not with external agents, how to make that decision. So the recording of that uh, is available and details of how to access that recording and today's, which has been recorded, will be shared with you uh, on a follow up email in due course. So look out for that. But back to this afternoon. So we are going to be joined. It's the turn of Lifestyle fit Fitness to now share their insight as part of this uh, series. So let me tell you a little bit about Lifestyle Fitness and our host today. So they operate sports and fitness clubs across the UK in partnership with schools, colleges and local authorities. So this afternoon, they're going to be sharing their experience of developing those facilities uh, that really enhance the health and well-being of your students, uh, the staff and the wider community. And today's speaker is James Lawrence, who's the Managing Director at Lifestyle Fitness. And James is going to be sharing some insights into uh, successful facilities, uh, ones that lots of case studies that they've worked on and talk you through the choices and the options that you might wish to consider to replicate some of that success. So he's going to discuss the benefits and the challenges of dual use facility and critically how to commercialise your offering to generate that income. So James, I'm uh, really pleased to hand over to you now and let you take on the, uh, on the session. Thank you Beth and I'm just going to get my slides up if that's okay. So hopefully you can all see this. Um, I'll just give me one moment. Great. Okay, um, so well, good afternoon. Firstly, thanks again, Beth, and welcome to this webinar. Um, as Beth said, I'm James Lawrence, and I'm the Managing Director of Lifestyle Fitness. Um, I've got over 10 years experience of working in and with dual use facilities. Um, and when you hear me talk about dual use, what I basically mean is that facilities that are used by both schools um, and also the community in tandem or the public, if you like. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking to you more about how you can develop a sports and fitness facility um, for your students, your staff, and and also the community. Um, so let me just move through. Um, so in the agenda, um, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit more background about us um, before I go into why sports and fitness provision matters. Um, I guess the fact that you're on this webinar probably says you already understand a lot of that. Um, but I'm also going to then go through what are the choices you have when it comes to operating model, give you some options around potential funding you could access, um, spend a little bit more time talking about how you can maybe commercialise your offering um, to the public. And again, very important to make sure we can cover those costs. Um, I'm then going to walk through a particular case study of a site that we're working, we've worked. Um, and at the end, I'll take some feedback and also answer any questions, which on which note, if you could just go through, there's a, you should hopefully see the Q&A section below. Um, and again, you can sort of put some, put a question in there and then Beth will kindly ask them to me all at the end and hopefully nice ones, please. <laughs> um, so who are we? Um, We've been operating now since 1982, um, and today we have over 30 sports and fitness clubs across the UK. Um, we operate in partnership with colleges, with schools and academies. Um, we also operate with community associations um, and also local councils. Um, so we like to take a flexible approach. Um, this is for a number of reasons, really. Um, one being um, creating an offering which suits our partners. So, for example, if there's a specific sport um, that the school is a specialist within, then we obviously want to make sure we cater for that. Um, we know that all schools are different. Some have existing facilities, others have spaces which could be converted. And again, we like to talk to the partners to really try and get down to um, identify the right solution for them. 
Um, finally, um, it's about the local market, um, which is a factor. So again, are there specific competitors in the area? Or maybe is there a particular demographic we're looking to attract? And again, we like to cater the offering um, according to that market for that reason. Okay, um, so we're on a bit of a mission. Um, we want to be the preferred partner of colleges, schools and academies um, in providing a relevant, sustainable and commercial sports and fitness offer to the students, staff and the local com community. Um, a bit of a mouthful, but when I sort of say commercial, um, what I'm really referring to is that it needs to be financially viable, again, to make sure that you can cover those operating costs um, that you might have. Um, okay, so... James, can I just, oh, for one sec, the screen doesn't seem to be moving your slides along. Oh, um, okay, thanks, Beth. She just wanted to put that out. Sure, is it, um, can you tell me which slide you're on, Beth? Uh, developing a sports and fitness facility for your students. Perfect, bear me one moment, I'm just going to come out <laughs> and back in. Thanks for that, Beth. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Great. Um, are you, where, what slide are you on now, Beth? We're on a mission. We're on a mission, perfect. We're, I'm going to try and reshare the screen, and if that doesn't work, we'll just stay like that. Um, how's that looking, Beth? Is that is that on where we are now? I can see where we are. Super. Um, back to where we are then. Um, okay, thank you. So um, our head office is based up in Darlington, um, but our, our clubs stretch across the UK. Um, so we're based from Ballymena um, to Birmingham, um, from Carlisle to Canterbury. Um, the whole sort of team is based nationwide and we're sort of you, across the UK. Um, so hopefully that has now changed. Um, so um, getting in a little bit more to why sports and fitness provision matters. Um, so firstly, let's sort of start off with the benefits um, of this sort of dual use facility. So um, again, the support for the PE curriculum um, and elite sports participation. Um, a new facility can be used um, for that PE curriculum and part of lessons. Um, and again, if you've got elite athletes um, that might benefit from access to specific equipment, it can all be catered for um, in a facility on your site. Um, we obviously know, and particularly poignant at the moment with, um, with COVID-19, the benefits of exercise and um, where it comes to physical and mental well-being. Um, so again, for your students and staff, having a, a facility on site um, is a great benefit to them as well. Um, external perceptions and reputation. Again, um, having a facility on site gives a greater appeal to students um, who may choose to come to your school or academy um, versus one down the road. And James was still stuck on slides. I'm sorry, I think it was working better when you weren't. Uh, I'm going to leave, I'll leave it like that then, Beth. Perfect. Because we're on where we are. Perfect. Can you see why sports and fitness provision? Yeah, yeah thank you. There we go. Don't you just love technology? Um, so, okay, so then we'll just carry on working through those there. So vocational opportunities um, that there is as well. So again, um, work experience for students, um, there could be placements as well. Um, and sometimes as well, those students that actually leave that are interested in sports could then become and start working in that facility. And there's opportunities for community engagement and also for families. So we find and um, on sites that you find parents um, would come to the facility as well, um, maybe with their, one of the pupils um, and also alumni um, that might also come back afterwards. Um, there's opportunities for income generation um, with the facility. Um, and again, there's, this actually provides a form of unrestricted funding um, for schools, which again could be used for maybe trips um, or sports activities. Um, so there's good options there. And I'll talk to you a little bit more later on about how you can sort of generate that income um, as well. Um, and then the other benefit is, of course, by having a facility on site, um, there's the opportunities for corporate connections. So again, for local businesses. Um, so in areas where we have large businesses, they do come and maybe exercise there or have a corporate membership. And again, lots more opportunities just to network out into the community. Maybe if, for example, there's a sports pitch there, there might be five aside. Um, lots of different opportunities that again can come from that. So that's the benefit. Um, we'll now go on to some of the challenges. The main challenge um, with obviously creating a dual use facility is where to get the capital investment from to create the facilities. Um, and we're going to talk about some potential options on that a little bit later. 
controlling op operating costs. Um, clearly, again, with operating costs there, you need to make sure that's under control because, of course, if it's a certain revenue level, um, what we don't want to be doing is funding out of education money to run an external facility. So really important that that's under control. Um, driving external revenue. And again, I, I find that is another, another one of the biggest factors we find is that making sure that revenue is at the right level. Um, and again, sales and marketing does come into this a little bit. So I will, I will touch on that later and spend a little bit more time talking about, you know, how to commercialize your offer um, and to make sure again that's that financial viability that I was referring to earlier. Um, <clears throat> also I think at the moment with the COVID pandemic um, this has become particularly um, fundamental um, because again we do see in certain sites of revenues being reduced um, so again it's important that we look at those sort of tips and strategies to make sure that um, that can be kept to the best level possible. Um, Local community and business links. Um, again, there's a bent that trying to build them um, initially takes some work, whilst there's benefit to getting them. Um, it just takes a little bit of work on your behalf getting it there in the first place. Um, one of the other challenges would be sort of staff management, development, um, you know, recruitment um, and retention of good staff um, can be tricky at times. Um, we know these sort of staff are key for providing a great service to the members and the communities. So um, one of the key things to try and get right. Um, another challenge um, clearly is when um, activity is no longer um, timetabled. So, for example, at GCSE level, how do we still keep those pupils active? Um, and again, I think sports facilities can help here. Um, and again, with sport being seen as elite and competitive, um, it gives us an opportunity for other students to maybe take part. OK, if, if at any stage my slides drop, please let me know, but hopefully you can still see it. So um, I'm going to go through next a little bit about the choices you've got when it comes to an operating model as you want to open for the public. Um, so the first one is an academy operated model. Um, this is typically with core, you know, with core staff. So maybe you have a PE teacher who's got a particular interest in this, someone in the sports department. Um, and again, maybe using the caretaker team to um, open up and shut the gym um, or um, pitches. Um, so we do find this is a really good starting point. And again, it's a good opportunity so you can keep those costs nice and low. Um, this is particularly okay for where you've got clubs and block bookings. Um, there's not lots of different people coming on site every week and you can kind of get into a bit of a routine. Um, but there clearly is a challenge with this. And I think that the main one I always hear is that it's a prioritization challenge. You know, if, if clearly if we're trying to um, run lessons as well as try and manage a facility, um, that can kind of take a bit of balancing there. So um, something to consider um, if you're looking at operating it with core staff. There's then the next option would be to operate it yourself, but to also then bring in dedicated staff. Um, again, this, this is great because you can get a bit of a wider offering um, and bring in different skills. But again, there's clearly there's a higher cost um, to operating it um, when you do bring in dedicated staff. Um, and there's clearly, again, just to make sure we think about the management challenge there. So um, who's going to manage the staff that are on site? Um, you know, how much involvement might it need from your school business manager? Um, so some, some considerations to think of um, when we do that. Another option um, which might be of interest is an arm's length subsidiary. Um, with these, you do get greater operating freedom. Um, and again, there's potential options to access external funding. Um, so again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, one of the things with this is just governance. Um, so usually it would be a separate legal entity um, and requires its own board of directors. So um, just something to think about there. But again, there is, there is some sort of benefit to some greater operating freedom than maybe you get with it being direct through the, the school itself. Um, there's then local authority. Um, so again, local authority centres typically have a really good clear community benefit. Um, there's pros and cons of that shared use. Um, one of the things are the drawbacks we do find sometimes the adaptability challenge. So for example, changing trends, um, trying to make sure we stay on top of those areas. So for example, um, if it might be changing types of equipment, how quick can we react to make sure the facility stays um, suitable for the sort of community use that we, we're getting. Um, so that's something to think about there. There's then going into the third party options, um, a couple of different methods that you could use if you wanted to outsource. Um, so one of these means would be um, looking at a typical management contract. 
A benefit again here would be um, there's wider expertise, there's skills that can come in um, from outside. Um, typically, um, this is the bread and butter of the party you're bringing in. So again, that it kind of takes a little bit of the weight off of your, your team. Um, but there's clearly sometimes benefits um, and risks do stay with, stay with the school on that one. So um, it's important to make sure that the contract's right um, when you do that. Um, Typically, these would be on a sort of set fee basis. Um, so again, you can find that that third party may have a slight incentive challenge um, because again, if they're, they're on a set fee or a set margin, um, there might be less incentive to, to drive things on. Um, the final option um, in terms of outsourcing um, is sort of a third party concession model where an external organization comes in and runs the facility for you completely. Um, again, exactly the same thing here. There's some wider expertise um, we can bring in. Um, and actually um, with this model, um, typically you would pass the commercial rig risk onto this entity. Um, so again, it can help de-risk the opportunity from the school um, so that actually again there's the they, they look after the day-to-day -day running of the facility um, one of the challenges um, we find with this is trying to identify the right partner um, and again we can talk about some strategies for that um, a little bit later okay so um, how to fund a facility um, there's a couple, a few different options available. Um, the first one um, would be um, grants and awards. Um, so it's worthwhile having a look at Sport England here. Um, there might be some opportunities for specific funding pots um, that you can access. Um, so it'd be worth getting in contact with Sport England and looking through their website. Um, they've also got some useful materials, which I have put a note at the end about that. You could also take a, bit of a look through. Um, maybe get in contact with your local council. Um, again, maybe there's opportunities there for some funding um, and have a little look through their websites and see the opportunities. Um, leasing is a, is a very good option. Um, typically, this is more for gym equipment as opposed to sort of capital works on the build. Um, but again, you can contact equipment manufacturers on this. So the likes of Techno Gym, Matrix, um, Core Health and Fitness, um, they can sort of work with you to come up with some different offerings here. Um, and then it, the other option might be potentially if you are looking to work with a third party, um, there might be some partnership funding that's available. Um, so again, the, there might be an opportunity where they actually provide some absolute funding or maybe even just provide a steady stream of income, which might underpin any sort of funding costs um, that you might have. Um, also, just a little note that obviously not sport will be speaking um, next week a little bit more about funding pitches um, and some options they have. So I would recommend tuning into that um, where they'll talk specifically on the sort of pitch element there. OK, well, hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour um, of how to fund the facility and what the options are. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about is commercialising your offering. Um, so I'm going to sort of run through these um, different areas um, and go through how you can make sure your facility is successful. Um, so the first one and the most important one is membership recruitment. Um, if you've obviously got a, a gym on site, you need to make sure that there's enough members um, as that really provides the, the income um, and funds the costs um, for your facility. Um, so there we need to obviously look at opportunities such as lead generation. Um, there's also walking traffic, which you might be able to generate through um, maybe posters or banners. Um, there's opportunities for outreach and leafleting, um, so that might be door to door, that might be going to shopping centres, workplaces, um, digital is, is a big growth area now, um, so again we find Google advertising um, particularly um, successful. Um, there is also then Facebook marketing, for example, that could be used Instagram and uh, we also have the likes of TikTok and Snapchat these days. So again, there's um, some other options there um, that you can try and make sure that you're relevant and hitting the communities you really want to hit. Um, and then finally, some of the more traditional forms and ones which, which we really think are interesting. And again, that's around community um, and charity work. Um, there's the opportunity to do some sponsorships that might be sponsoring local football teams um, and get, get out there that way. Um, it could be some sort of fundraising, um, working with some sort of charities on that. Um, and finally, bringing in external clubs. So, for example, um, there's walking clubs, running clubs, um, again, some all opportunities to try and make sure you're getting out there into the marketplace. OK, um, and then the next important thing, once we've attracted those members to the to the gym, is to make sure they stay with us. Um, so, again, there's a sort of an old um, thought that maybe gym members that don't attend 
pretend the gym is a positive thing because they're paying but actually unfortunately um, we can uncover that myth that they do cancel um, and typically we find after sort of three months of not using a facility um, that they'll go and maybe do that so um, it's really important to make sure members are engaged and are using the club um, and then might be goes against the grain but again make it easy to cancel um, let's try and make sure that it's a good service and that people that leave us want to come back and typically when we're in smaller catchments and communities you do find that members um, will come and go over time um, but the main thing is we give them a good experience and that they want to come back so again a, a thought there um, making sure there's a proper welcome and induction um, is really important um, and that can be something that you can work with your team to ensure that there is there um, tracking attendance and prompting a discussion when people don't attend um, and there's systems that can be used to support with this so again that's something to have a look at is what sort of software package you might use um, when managing uh, maybe the gym or also um, pitches and, and rentals etc and again members that take part in classes or maybe personal training um, do typically stay longer and are more engaged so again opportunities to have classes and i'll talk about that in a minute um, is very very useful okay zoning so i think it's really important to make sure that the fitness facility you create um, has the right elements in it so um, there's obviously an element of cardio resistance functional and free weights which are really important and that mix is kind of 25 percent now so um, it's important to make sure your fitness your facility remains relevant um, to the community if you want to attract um, those people in um, and make sure that you can sort of hit those um, revenue levels you need to help sustain the cost um, so again, equip, we, we sort of say equip the gym to the membership as opposed to the space. So um, limit maybe numbers of cross trainers or steppers, which traditionally go back five or 10 years might have been used more. Um, we now want more to actually have um, more space. Um, and also again, on your resistance equipment, which would have made up a large part of um, the gym weights area. Um, again, we sort of say to maybe use dual use machines. And when I say dual use, what I mean is maybe a machine that can do chest and shoulders at the same time, but that all really depends on your space. And it's something for you to consider um, when you would look at doing that initial fit out. Um, finally, um, really important to think about service and maintenance um, as well of that, um, because clearly you've only got a small number of pieces of equipment. Um, if members come in and equipment's broken, um, that can be quite frustrating. And again, might affect that member retention we've just talked about. So something just to think about there um, as you work, work through. Um, Next, we'll move on to studios and classes. Um, having a good class program is a really big attraction for parents and the community. Um, and we find a good varied timetable does attract people to your club. Um, so it's important to look when you're doing the setup at studios um, and how you can fit these in. Um, so for example, a multifunctional studio, which may be able to take um, HIIT training or yoga um, is a useful, um, Thing to try and find um, and also opportunities there for maybe a spin studio um, so that's cycling if you have again spare space that can be used as part of that or maybe a studio that can double up for both um, that's really useful because again a really, if you can keep create that good type class timetable um, we do find that keeps people coming more regularly um, and really when we talk about building a community and building loyalty um, that's a real key part of it. So that would be a, a top tip if you were to look to do a, a facility to try and make sure you do have a good class timetable um, to go along it. Okay, one of the other important things um, in terms of um, commercialising your offering is to make sure that you have the right staff um, and the right service levels. Um, so again, we really do find that within these facilities that the team is the differentiator um, and separates you apart from the competition. And, and typically, you know, one of the, I think one of the questions we sometimes get is that I'm, I'm, so I'm nearby larger low cost gym, so maybe a gym group or a pure gym, is it worth building a facility? Well, actually, it probably is. However, um, making sure you give that far more personalised service, um, and again, you can still you would still attract a slightly different market that maybe doesn't want to train at that facility. Um, so, really important that we get this piece right. Um, and again, sort of them working interaction with members um, is very very key. Um, and again, it helps to improve perceptions. Um, and they're vital as community champions. Um, again, these, these people can help people um, get fit, change their life. Um, and again, we do find them sometimes acting even as role models in facilities. So um, a really important thing to make sure you get your sort of recruitment selection right and get good people. Um, 
once you've got those good people, again, the challenge is to retain those people. Um, so again, it's good to try and find people that are passionate about what they're doing um, and people are also committed. Um, so again, some ideas you might want to look at. Um, as well as obviously recruiting employed staff, um, if you are running a timetable, you would need to look to recruit instructors. Um, and again, that would be the responsibility of those staff who would typically manage that. Um, but again, this can pose a bit of a challenge, just trying to identify um, the right people. Um, and again, if you can find the right people, um, they typically bring along their fans. Um, so a real benefit there if you can find um, good class instructors. Um, Personal training um, is, an, again, a very important part of the offering, um, because, again, if you can keep people achieving their goals, um, they're more likely to keep coming to your facility. Um, so we do find that actually the self-employed personal trainers can typically be some of the best because they're a little bit more motivated because they earn their own income. So they would typically charge customers direct um, and then they probably would pay a small element, element back of that in a rental income. So, again, when we're talking about Trying to make sure that sort of revenue is sustainable this is a really good part of that as well um, as well as obviously offering an engagement um, and then we move on to sort of pitch bookings um, and other revenue um, and it's important to kind of think about there this sort of ease of administration um, and of staffing um, you probably need staff to make sure you can open um, and close facilities um, if you have facilities like maybe badminton courts, um, you'd need to obviously set those up um, and take them down. So again, it's just thinking about um, the right staffing levels you might need for those bookings. Um, ease of booking, again, really important. Um, so looking about how you can get people booked, um, make take payment um, and also refund when it's required. So again, we find that an, a, a good system is really important there. Um, so either, you know, having a sort of manual calendar and being on top of it, or ideally a booking system that you could maybe use online as well. So um, you can actually take bookings and payment that way um, is a useful thing to consider. Um, and then other considerations um, in terms of other sort of revenue lines might be um, an on-site cafe um, that you might have. And again, you need to think about management of that, that facility um, or potentially um, stock you might sell. So maybe it's um, I don't know, shuttlecocks or squash balls, etc. cetera. Um, those are all things to sort of think about. And again, that sort of cash handling element, um, how that goes, and I, you know, check general recommendation. If you can make these things um automatic and contactless and with, without needing to take cash um, then it's slightly better because it's just one less process and one less thing to control um, i'm going to walk you through a little case study um, of the site we we've done um, in wiltshire um, so this is at avon valley college um, and this the academy came to us seeking a sort of best in class facility um, we undertook a two-stage conversion for them um, looking at underutilized spaces and you can see in the image here um, this was an old car garage um, and we kind of took this painted it refloored it added air conditioning um, and reopened it obviously as a, a fitness facility so that again how you can maybe turn a disused facility into something that's now of use um, again, they were key that we wanted engagement with the local community um, and they had a preference for a concession model, you know, for those different reasons we spoke about earlier. Um, they weren't so keen to manage it themselves, but wanted a third party. Um, so that facility opened initially back in 2011. Um, they initially opened with sort of the key areas. And I spoke to you about how this equipment mix has changed over time. So um, that club initially opened with um, more of a cardio mix and resistance weights. So as times change, we then came back to do a later um, piece of work to bring it in. You can see in this image here of the second scheme, it's far more sort of functional equipment. Um, they have separate controlled access for the public um, who come in um, and they originally the site was open um, evenings and weekends um, and as a result actually of the works that were done it's now open all day um, and got separated access from the school and that can work um, very well um, also. Um, there's then the um, creation of a new functional training zone um, and the larger free weights, which you can see um, in the image we have here. Um, in addition to this, um, the site also has mugger pitches um, that were converted at the time um, as well. Um, the facility now today has over 800 members. Um, it's a sort of it's a key part of the community down there um, in Durrington. Um, and again, 
that we do have over 200 students and staff who are members so um, there's a teen gym club runs there so every day after school a number of um, teenagers um, come through the facility um, with under one of our instructors um, and do an hour's activity um, before going home so again a really great benefit for their sort of physical and mental well-being um, and a selection of staff also use the site so maybe if they have a short lunchtime break or maybe before teaching um, they come and use the club um, so again a real a real nice benefit there um, we've also done some work placements and work experience um, for students who have come and worked with us in the gym um, and finally, it's really important down there that we, we engage with the community and we really see the benefits of that paying dividends um, in the membership. Um, so again, sponsoring the local football team, um, we chose to sponsor Durrington Football Club there and all of their teams. So they also come and do um, activities and hire this room out from us as well for their pre-season training. And it's that, it's that whole round community benefit that you get by um, installing a sports, sports and fitness facility in the community. Um, there's also some charity fundraising. It's quite a large military base um, nearby. Um, so again, sort of help for heroes. We do a lot of work down there um, supporting those, um, those charities and causes. Um, and again, there's some opportunities down there that have been taken to build business links. Um, so the local businesses down there um, do come and train at the facilities and have a sector selection of corporate memberships and again actually we've worked with the school there to help build bigger relations um, so again opportunities for work experience have been created as well so it's just getting out there getting into the community and getting known and, and really creating one of these facilities um, gives the option for that Okay, I'm going to, um, I've sort of flown through this quite quickly. So of course, there might be a few questions which have popped up. So please do um, send them in. Um, there's a few resources um, I've put on the side of these slides. So um, please do feel free to, to click through these. And what we will do is we'll send these out so you can have a look at these in more detail. Um, so we do have um, a Sport England um, link here. And again, they sort of talk you through a little bit more about some of those decisions to make um, that I was talking you through earlier. Um, there's then a couple of brochures I've attached to our own uh, material, which talks about how do you really build that community? Um, and again, some information um, walking you through this process. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly leave you with a few photos um, before giving a few minutes to sort of gather the questions in. Um, so you can see there, there's to the left hand side, there's the same site I was showing you. Um, the site in the middle is Canterbury High School. Um, to the right hand side is a new facility we're looking at opening um, just north of, with a school just north of London very shortly. Um, and the bottom left um, is a site in Briarley Hill, um, in, just near to Birmingham. Um, so again, you can see all really great facilities that can be created um, within schools. Um, so at this stage, if it's OK, Beth, um, I'll hand back over to you um, to maybe go through any questions that have come in. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, James, for talking us through that. The case studies really helped bring it to life. It's fantastic to see the work that you're you're doing. Um, so, yes, everyone, absolutely. Please do to, uh, take this opportunity to speak to James so you can pop a question in the chat function and we'll pick it up. Lovely to see our audience today, global. We've even got a participant wow. from uh, Nigeria. <laughs> so hello, Very fantastic cool. to have a really wide remit of people here joining us. So James, I will uh, I will kick off and get the discussion going. Sure. So, I mean, it, it's got to be asked, hasn't it? How has the past 12 months, the COVID-19 lockdown really kind of impacted uh, fitness and fitness facilities and how, how viable is this sort of opportunity going forward as we were still kind of looking at that roadmap? What are your thoughts and experience in the past 12 months? Yeah, sure. Um, very, yeah, well, very good question. And I think um, clearly one which is um, very relevant at the moment. Um, and of course, it's been a very, very tough um, 12 months. You know, the fitness sector has been closed for large periods um, and thankfully is now back open. And, um, and classes are due to actually open in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so, so yeah, what have, what have the impacts been? Um, I think um, one of our main ones, the most important one, clearly besides sort of basic, from a basic business level, is how do we keep our people engaged? Um, so again, making sure staff are engaged um, has probably been a bit of a key challenge for us. Um, so again, 
that's been something which we've needed to work quite hard on trying to make sure people are engaged and you know clearly some of the staff are self-employed so um support for them has been a bit tricky um but in terms of, you know from a business element and for specific um you know schools that might have been operating facilities i think what's been really tricky is kind of those membership volumes have been reduced um obviously bookings have been stopped at times um, so, you know, we do find some of the gyms have lost sort of maybe up to a third of their members, um, but, you know, they are still viable. Um, and I think it's just a period of time it's going to take for this to recover. Um, early stats coming out of, um, of fitness clubs is that lots of people still want to join. Um, and actually, it could be a very, very big period for these facilities. So, um, yeah, in a nutshell, it's been it's been very tricky, um, but certainly these facilities are relevant. Um, however, it's been a bit of a tough period. Um, and clearly, anyone that's running a, a facility probably understands that um, the finances have taken a temporary hit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I did love your recommendation of reaching out to local you know, walking groups and running groups, which is obviously really outdoor activities that have had to pick yeah. up in popularity over the past 12 months. So I love that idea of reaching out to them and, and thinking about their kind of their usage of these facilities to enhance, enhance their offer and mix up what they're doing. Um, thank you. So you, you spoke a little bit about partnership funding, mm. which is really interesting. Have you got any sort of examples on on someone who's made that approach or uh, on how that looks on reaching out to partners and engaging them with this facility or this concept of creating a facility? Yeah, sure. There's, there's, there's different ways can go with partnership funding. So again, um, if it maybe is towards um, sports pitches, et cetera, and they can actually reach out to local businesses who might want to contribute maybe in return for some sort of advertising or sponsorship. Um, which can be again a good opportunity there and um, then other ways of, of, of partnership funding is, is clearly if you're working with maybe a third party um, that actually they can come in and maybe fund part of the work themselves so maybe build some of these facilities out for you um, or certainly um, by working with a partner um, what you can then do is kind of produce a steady stream of income which allows you to maybe go and fund that facility or, or, or access funding against that facility there. So there's, there's lots of different funding options you, that, are, that are out there um, for building these works. But clearly um, what schools don't want to be doing is taking on large sort of capital risks. So again, by working with partners, you can kind of reduce that a little bit. So that, that's a couple of just early thoughts on that. Absolutely. And thinking about uh, a transformation, how long does, you know, I know it's a bit of a, how long is a piece of string, but some of the examples, how long has it taken for, for a refurb, for a fit out? When should we be thinking about planning this? I mean, summer yeah. seems prime, but can it be done quite quickly? Yeah, well, well, well but the, the answer is, I mean, it can, it can be done quickly, and it, it, it probably does depend on what you're doing. Clearly, if there's obviously um, planning permissions that need seeking, projects can take a lot longer to do. Um, and I do find sometimes one of the biggest facts is probably bureaucracy and obviously managing this. Clearly, there's a big process to go through. So um, sometimes the you know we do work with partners where it maybe takes um, a couple of years even to, to create a facility. Um, but we can also, again, from a, a logistical point of view, maybe turn this around in sort of three months um, or so as well so um, again there's it, 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 it can vary but certainly um, three months a minimum to kind of do a facility and turn a contract around um, however um, you know if you if the, the sort of longer you can you can plan this in the better really yeah absolutely I can, say, I can imagine there's quite a process you've already listed some of the questions that people need to consider so a real process to think about looking into it um, so where do we start in terms of space? I mean, how much space do you actually need? You've mentioned some fantastic Ooh. zoning areas <laughs> from cardio fitness to functional weights to space to just work out on, on mats and things. I mean, what is a consumer looking for? What's an ideal space to fit out and offer this opportunity out to the community? Yeah, sure. So again, there's lots of different options to that. And, and earlier, as I was talking about, you know, it's, I think it's important to take a flexible approach to that. Um, so I, I think, you know, typical, the typical sort of places we usually see within schools is unfortunately squash courts do sometimes come out to, um, to putting in a fitness facility, but maybe in a site where you've got, for example, if you're lucky enough to have four squash courts, maybe two of them could actually be taken out and turned into a gym. Um, so again, each squash court is around sort of 70, 70 meters squared. So if you were sort of take a two squash court conversion, 
um, that kind of would work quite neat for a, a small facility, but you can maybe get sort of five, 600 um, community members that come there as well, as well as creating obviously a great facility um, for pupils to use. Um, but other, other, you know, if you wanted to go to a slightly larger scheme, um, you could take, for example, an old gymnasium. There's opportunities if you've got larger access to capital funds to maybe put a mezzanine floor in and you can access both. Um, and, and there are projects as well, um, you know, where actually we work, we're working with a, with a partner at the moment um, um, as part of a new completely new block um, so again that's sort of a 800 square meter facility um, and that's going to go alongside classrooms and actually it's quite a very interesting concept there because the the funding actually from the revenue from the community is actually funding the works for the classrooms as well so lots of different ways of of doing this really so i think that the answer is quite a flexible approach but um yeah i, I think i think minimum you kind of need sort of 100 100 square meters something like that to get a to get a basic facility that can be open to the community but of course if it's just for you know you're looking for something that's maybe not open to community then you know you can go under that slightly for pupils absolutely yeah um so we're going to take some we've we've gone for it we've we've converted our facility we're going to take some stepping stones into into opening it what are the best what's your recommendations around the best sort of times i can imagine it depends who you're trying to target but you know 24 hour it would just be it's a huge step so yes. is it kind of early morning is it daytime when do you think is the best time to kind of be open and have those is it those availability hours yeah good good question um well the, the good thing and this is why where i think you know schools and and, and fitness facilities do work hand in hand is, is the typical busy time for facilities is actually mornings and evenings um, we do find that facilities are busiest, so actually it works quite neatly around a school day. Um, so again, that's a, a good option there that you could even start off with sort of a morning and evening opening. Um, but we do find if you want to get in that larger membership, it's really important to, to maybe open all day um, over time. So again, there's different stepping stones you can take with that, but certainly um, evenings, weekends are really neat starting point. Um, mornings also gives the opportunity for people that maybe want to train um, before work. And some of those facilities we find maybe even open an hour before the public to the school so the school can come in as well so there's there's lots of different ways to doing it and again i think you know building up to that sort of all day opening um and um as you say 24 hours is a very big step but um interestingly we are we are working with one one um one school at the moment where we're doing a 24 hour um facility so yeah i think there's, there's a very flexible approach on that wow bold ambitions 24 hour wow. <laughs> um, want to train at night these days <laughs> and like you said as well there's options to with software to track track that engagement see see what attendance is and get a bit of a feel i suppose about how the facilities are being used across different uh, peak points isn't there so you can definitely take the moment to reflect on it and see where there might be greater opportunity and appetite um you made an interesting comment about i mean this would be, I imagine being the luxury but Coffee shops, um, you know, really making it a bit of a hub space. Uh, we've seen them in you know, plenty of facilities, sort of coffee shops and spaces to sit and, and relax afterwards or pre-workout. Is that something sort of in-house or is that something, you know, working with external agents? How does something like that work, having a coffee shop on, on site? Yeah, there's there's different there's different things we see. So um, obviously it depends firstly on your models, whether you're running it yourself or with a third party. Um, but also, so if you if you are running it um, yourself, you could maybe um, bring a third party in to run the coffee shop. So under some sort of regular concession agreement um, that you might get them in. Um, or you could provide it to the, the main third party contractor. Um, but a more innovative way, and one I really like at our, one of our sites in Canterbury, in fact, is that the school actually operated themselves with their catering department. And I, so, when I say, so when I say catering department, sorry, I'm more referring to um, student cat um, catering um, courses. So actually they do a sort of um, a post 16 course that they do catering and they actually run the um, coffee shop at the site as well. So again, I thought a really neat, innovative way there to, to kind of build that wider community link and really start joining all the dots up at the site so um yeah lots of lots of ways you can do it but that that was a particular one i i, I really thought and that was canterbury high school there i thought it was a great idea that's a fantastic idea it brings it back more to a social enterprise model as well isn't it thinking a bit more around kind of the investment and the income as well as the impact so i love that as an extra kpi fantastic story for partners businesses you know, think about enhancing the education system through the facility. Uh, fantastic model. So
So is there anything that we should be considering around, you know, accessibility? It, it could be quite an unusual space. Um, is there any sort of absolute you know, best practice or at the very least the standards that we need to think about uh, around our unusual space that we want to refer that makes it as accessible and open as possible to, to everyone who may wish to use it. Yeah, I think I think the key, I mean, depending on what obviously where, where you can locate the facility probably makes a difference. I mean, clearly, if you've got an opportunity to maybe locate it near the front of your site or near somewhere where there's parking, I think that's really great. Um, but clearly, that's not always an opportunity. So I think, you know, just looking at how you can develop your site to cater for that. Um, and again, when you refer to accessibility, you know, you might have disabled users who want to come into the facility. So it's really important to make sure, you know, we cater with that, with um, making the correct um, adjustments there as well as possible. So, um, yeah, I, th I think my, my general advice would be bringing it as close as you can to the front, but kind of considering all those different options, um, you know, whether you might need a lift if part of it's on a second floor, um, you know, there's lots of different, different options around that. Fantastic. Okay, so again, thinking about to uh, commercialising it, bringing mm. in the income, which is the important part, obviously, to make it a sustainable opportunity for ourselves. Um, and I guess this might be even reflecting on what has happened in the past 12 months, but where do we even start with thinking about rates, uh, you know, membership rates, class rates, um, you've talked about different segments, you've talked obviously about stu you know, student staff, uh, corporate rates, and then how do we even know where to, what, what's the research into that, where do we even know how to position ourselves in the marketplace, and like some kind of David Lloyd to, to more of a sort of a, a JD or or one of those options where do we even begin to think about how we position ourselves yeah that that's a, that's a good question and, and um you know there's lots of factors which roll into pricing um so i think firstly to consider is you know how, you know what is your offering like um do you have the right facilities there is it a nice offering um it's important to kind of think about in that price element there um clearly if it's particularly a well-invested um center you might be able to charge a little bit more to customers um and i think one of the, the fundamentals which impacts this is is also sort of competitors um so again if you are located next door to maybe a pure gym or a gym group uh, who are charging 15 pounds a month you know you are you are going to find it a little bit trickier to maybe charge a lot more than that but as i say it, it it kind of depends on the offering and you know different people will like to use you know a school facility as opposed to maybe going in one of their gyms um so i mean you know rates do vary i don't you know i i i wouldn't anticipate any schools being able to charge david lloyd necessarily rates but um i certainly think you know a, a benchmark we always look at is sort of the mid 20 pounds we always think is a good is a good starting point and kind of to work up and down from there so again if you've got a large low cost competitor you might want to bring that down slightly maybe you're in a rural area there's no competitors and you're going to be looking at less members in which case you might need to push that up that's for a gym clearly if you've got swing pools as some of us as some sites might do um, you might need to charge a little bit more or have bolt-on options and you can also build packages so you know badminton squash tennis you know you can build all these different things into packages so um yeah i think th those things are really important look at competitors look at the local market look at you know how, how affluent you know the affluency levels and what and what really is is suitable and then we also look at you know when you're talking about rates different different prices as well so typically you know you might you probably discount it to your staff um, and certainly when i was talking about things like team gym you know you want to make that really accessible the key is to get lots of people using this facility and get lots of people fit so i think the key there is to really make those sort of opportunities accessible as possible Thank you. Actually, I was going to ask you about Team Gym. Mm. <laughs> Great idea. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you'd be able to answer this, but interesting to those that you've worked with, a little bit of insight around kind of really positioning that. Obviously, there's got to be a real um, balance between encouraging kind of health and well-being. But, you know, it's a teenager, incredibly self-conscious. It can also be incredibly daunting just to walk into a gym for the first time, sort of 14, 15 mm -hmm. Have you seen it or can you share a great example about what that looks like in practice about um, this group of young people and the messaging and the way that they were educated into into fitness um, and what that meant back to them rather than it being, you know, uh, a, a sort of a, 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 a pro profile around kind of glamour or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, so I, th I, th I think the important thing with um, when you're doing a team gym session is to look at how you induct those um, people coming along to the session. So I think firstly, just setting expectations, you know, it's a safe environment, that um, the most important thing is that people are benefiting themselves. It's about, you know, 
physical um, exercise, it's about making sure people are mentally fit. And, and that's the way it's framed really, as opposed to kind of this sort of, gyms can sometimes have this misconception that they, you know, they're, they're daunting places to go in. And that's where I think this is really valuable is actually breaking down that barrier um, nice and early um, and getting and getting teams in and we've got some really successful examples um, Newbury um, being one where again you know our the manager is extremely popular with a lot of pupils and actually they even go to confide with her when there's issues maybe they've got even you know at home or at school it's a really nice way actually after school to kind of de-stress a little bit go into something and actually you know go into it also sometimes when you know as, as, as they do some teams might actually even go and stay afterwards or so when the public come in and that's that that's fantastic to see actually how you know they learn to respect the facility and learn how things you know to, to exercise in a public zone as well um so you know there's lots of lots of opportunities and benefits which come from that fantastic so tell us a little bit more around kind of working with a third party uh, like yourselves um what's the kind of full suite of offer is it kind of helping with recruitment like you say those kind of personal trainers uh, to the to the more the kind of um operational staff uh, those uh, software systems, cleaning, you know, what's the kind of level of support from the, from the lightest touch to, to just basically handing it all over to someone like yourselves? <laughs> Yeah, and and and, and the, the, you know, there's there's lots of different options on that. I mean, there's a couple of different ways we've worked, we've worked traditionally. You know, we've worked in the past. You know, with some sites where maybe they need initially a facility. Um, uh, more help at the start getting a facility up and running but actually they were happy to operate it themselves and use their staff to manage the facility over time um, so actually you might be able to find an organization um, who again will provide that upfront and maybe just that ongoing marketing support um, as, as we move forwards um, or again as we find more more so now is actually schools are coming to us and saying do you know what we're excellent within education but we're not quite so sure in terms of running gyms and commercial fitness facilities which is absolutely fine again that's you know it's what we do day in day out so um in that we would basically take it from start to finish we would basically bring in architects work out the sort of space that's there what size is available create a facility and work with them on sort of a funding structure there so actually you know maybe we can underpin with some stable income so they can go out and access some funding and in certain instances sometimes Sometimes we put some funding in as well to help them build the facility initially, help them with kit um, financing, and then actually running it lock, stock and barrel. So staffing it, marketing it, um, and also running what we love to do is get involved in those community activities. So it's not just a separate commercial enterprise and site. Actually, it's really part of that community. So we're doing the team gym clubs. We're sponsoring local football teams. We're doing charity fundraising work, you know, all those different things, which to be honest, make the facility successful. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's multitude of different ways to work, but I, you know, uh, again, the, the, the possibility to actually have it all ran for you is there as well. Fantastic. Um, possibly putting aside the past 12 months because obviously that's been very very unique but you honestly spoke about attrition we have to accept that there will be people who just need to cancel perhaps they've just come up with an injury or obviously things like pregnancy or it's just not working out for them uh, for example do you have a, a a sort of baseline on what attrition might be ignoring the past 12 months and equally how you kind of like you, you spoke a few words about it but it'd be interesting to have those top tips around either preventing or re-engaging or um, just thinking about new mechanisms to think attrition is going to happen. So we need to think about that 10% coming back into the business. Completely. Yeah, and, and, and listen, you know, I think any any operator, um, no matter how good um, you are, will find people will come and go because that's life, right? You know, people have different things. Maybe there's different things going on. Maybe you move away. So there will be a natural attrition rate. Um, so I think the important thing is, is the there's there's then a natural attrition rate and then there's that amount over the top and that's the area that can be controlled. Um, so really, really simple ways of actually controlling attrition is just making sure you, you know, staff are being nice and friendly when people are coming in and actually people feel part of something, part of a community and that there's a reason to go back for their next workout. So really simple starting point is actually just that reason to come back for the next workout and always planning when's that next workout going to be is a really good starting point on attrition. 
Um, other prevention strategies clearly is proactive retention management. So for example, if somebody hasn't attended for 30 days, you could maybe pick up the phone and say sort of, hi, Beth, I notice you haven't been in. Um, any sort of reason for that? Can I get you booked back in maybe with an instructor or do you want me to put things on freeze for you and we get you started back when you're ready to come back? You know, proactively working with and caring for customers, I think is really important. Um, and again, those are sort of different ways and tips um, to try and manage that retention there. But Unfortunately, you will get a natural rate of retention, but it's trying to, to, to minimize that, that amount on top and make sure, again, you're offering a good service, you're looking at feedback, you're looking at your reviews, you're listening to what people are saying. You know, is somebody saying that actually you, you're missing some dumbbells or something's not working for their work? And actually, there's a lot of people saying the same thing and you can solve that problem. So again, it's, it's keeping on top of all these things and, and sort of keeping all eyes on the ball. Yeah, and I can imagine obviously working with someone like yourselves, equipment can be, relatively simple you know moved around you can look at the dynamics of the space like you say what's what's on trend with the community that you're attracting as members and just make slight tweaks to to address like you say any feedback and ensure exactly. the space really is there uh, really is kind of um hitting the point hitting their kind of their satisfaction thinking about our staff so um all of our wonderful like you said you know staff members that can access this opportunity have you had any feedback from uh, clients who have said it's really made an impact on kind of staff well-being or um, you know, it's, it's kind of the morale and how mm. they've been utilising it? Do they enjoy being there in the public? Is it better to have sort of space, you know, safe times? Like you say, there's hours that are separate. What's that engagement like with staff? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's different opportunities you can do with this is one, obviously, just allowing staff and we do find staff particularly like to use the, the, the gym in the morning, maybe before um, they start teaching. It's typically quiet and maybe less, less pupils might be in the gym at the time. So we do find that's one of the times they enjoy to come to the facility. Um, but also then we do look at specific things. So actually, is there an opportunity to maybe put a staff, um, staff Zumba class on or a staff spin class or, you know, specific things that actually it then becomes rather than just being a you can go to the gym there's actually some sort of team building some engagement um going back in as well um and again i think you know we've you know we see lots and lots of positive reviews and lots of staff users regularly and i think one of the one of the good things usually is we actually find that the sort of senior management teams come for facility as well which really sets that example across there that well-being is important um and you know that they want you know look after physical and mental um, well-being of, of of staff as well as of course students absolutely thank you and then thinking about, you know, the proposition, like you said, it's a really mm. big decision. That's a lot of processes to think through. Um, but how do how do you work with the, your, your clients and your schools to think how long such an investment is really going to bring that return? So obviously, there's a big amount of investment up front but to think about our rates, think about attracting those members uh, and like keeping them as members as well. Um, you know, this is obviously a long term vision. We spoke about it at the uh, last webinar as well, that this isn't, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. It's absolutely a long term vision. Where, what are some great case studies where you've seen that really over kind of a couple of years coming to life for them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and I think investment's an interesting one. I think the, the main investment clearly is when you first create a facility to obviously that's more sort of the creating the building works, making sure the rooms are the right sizes, maybe things like putting air conditioning systems in um, are probably the initial upfront major capital costs. And those are kind of, I say one off, but there's clearly a replacement cycle on those facilities after a period of time. Um, but those those sort of things are more one offs um, equipment. Um, interestingly, people always wonder how long equipment lasts. And I, I mean, the, the, the key with that really is how well do you look after the equipment? So if the equipment's really well looked after, if it's well maintained, it actually lasts a very long time. And, you know, we uh, we, we do have some pieces of equipment that are over 15, 20 years old in the nice. estate because, you know, you have a, a weight stack and you, you change the cable on it. And actually the cable is changing each time, but the weight stack doesn't change a lot. So besides styling, actually the equipment doesn't change. But, you know, clearly there's trends and investments and things like that. So there's areas where actually there's a specific piece of equipment that hasn't changed, but actually you might put some pieces in and then three or four years later, they're out of fashion and there's a new thing, there's a new um, toy on the market. And again, I think that's key to keep looking at those new things coming through so as I mentioned with that zoning functional training go back 10 years probably wasn't really being mentioned nowadays you go into gyms and that's a big big part of it you know making sure that there's all those different 
different piece of equipment. So I think, you know, those things are, are areas to think of, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, this isn't a sort of a fire, you know, to sort of do this for a term and then we maybe go back. This is part of a wider strategy. It's where well-being is fundamental to, you know, the academy or the multi-academy trust. And, you know, it works on a long-term basis there. So I think it's important to kind of consider this with a, as an overall strategy rather than maybe a sort of, uh, maybe a quick, a quick sort of or something absolutely nothing really quick about this yeah. so just looking at the time i'm going to give you an opportunity so when it's on a real high after a very challenging 12 months for uh for the fitness industry and um, you've touched on those kind of hot trends that have really occurred over the past few years you know and obviously weights and uh, have kind of really come, come forward but tell us about kind of the last few weeks of reopening tell us about the buzz tell us about you know the great stories that you've hear, heard heard from clients and, and now thinking and your facilities sorry and thinking about going forward I'm assuming now's the time to seize the opportunity of people wanting to come out of lockdown and get fit yeah absolutely no the, the, the last few weeks have been fantastic and um, I know we, we sort of found after lockdown one that actually you know we, we were really surprised and clearly there's a, a nervousness around opening there was lots of new procedures um, you know you've got new, new sort of sanitization methods are customers going to clean the equipment uh, is it going to be too busy how are people going to behave and that you know I think what's been incredible is to see how people just want to get back want their fitness have missed this um, and it's part of their lives and I think you you know there's also a lot of things you know if you unfortunately if you read some of the the press you might read that nobody's going to come back to a gym because you can now do a Davina McCall video online or something so um, you know that that uh, thankfully for us um, doesn't hasn't run true um, clearly there's a growth in in, in digital training but um, people have come back and they've loved it feedback's been overwhelming and, and actually have found demand um, way ahead of, of what we might have expected this time round so I think um, if, if people are like me as well they're just glad to get back in the gym be able to exercise again and um, start getting back to some sort of uh, some sort of normality so so no it's been um, it's been great oh wonderful that's fantastic congratulations to you and all of the schools that you work with that's superb news to hear especially that people are finding uh, that safe space literally uh, and figuratively as well to get back into exercise so uh, yeah it's fantastic to hear so James, thank you so much for your time, sharing your presentation and, and all of your experience uh, thus far. And like I say, we wish you a fantastic time 12 months going forward. Everybody, you are more than welcome to get in touch with James. We will actually be proactively getting in touch with you to obviously thank you for your time, sharing James' contact details, which she's also doing there, sharing James' contact details and how to, and like I say, access the recording from today and from last week. The third instalment of this series is next week 13th of may with our friends not sport uh, and duncan from not sport will be sharing funding advice for your new sport or play facility as james said, uh, said before thinking really creatively about accessing a funding stream to bring that vision uh, to life so we really hope to see you there please do share uh, the the sign up link uh, to your kind of friends and colleagues we'd absolutely love to have more people join us on this journey but like i say the recording will be available so you can look back on it once again james thank you so much for your time thank you everyone for joining us and we're really looking forward to seeing you again next week <laughs>